We are at war. Yes, war. Get your armor on and get ready for battle. No, not in a physical way, of course. I'm simply making the point that we're in an ideological war. I think we've been in one for a very long time. But I want to highlight something as a content creator who was once a devout, extremely devout Christian who sincerely wanted to know the truth. And if God was true, I was going to scream his gospel from the rooftops for the remainder of my days until I passed. But over the years of studying and my own difficulties in life made me start realizing both a combination that maybe this God isn't really there. And maybe this book isn't really giving me the only way or the truth. And there are several paths in the world that supposedly lead us to bliss, to some form of heaven or something. And it wasn't just Jesus and Christianity. It was my recognition of seeing mythology, comparative mythology, that really made me go, hold on, this isn't the only story. And that was the early phases of my coming out of this Christianity. Early phases, just just recognizing that other gods made claims, did miracles, were some people that ruled and were judges of the afterlife, where when we die, we go there. So is that God going to be the one ruling it, or is it Jesus, or is it someone else? So just that first initial recognition made me go, hold on, there's other claims. And a lot of them sometimes have similarities. Nothing is identical, even though originally the Zeitgeist movie tries to paint it that way. I noticed online that a lot of Christian apologists, and I'm going to use the term, they'll probably think the same thing of me, and that's totally fine with me. I think my argumentation and what I'm doing stands up for itself. I think there's pearl clutching. I think that they are special pleading without a doubt. Their religion is true, even if it's birthed in the framework and world in which several deities, several apotheoses, several miracles, several portent divine miracle births, several of these are taking place, but theirs is true. See, I think they're buried in an ideology that has them trapped. And my goal with Myth Vision is not to convince the apologist YouTube channels. Would I love to see some of these apologists uh, stop being apologetic in the way that they are framework, that making their arguments for Christianity and such? Sure. And I can guarantee you they know their arguments aren't going to do the same for me. Not even a little. In fact, their arguments make me realize something psychological is really going on here. And I know we're not supposed to psychoanalyze. I get it. I get it all the time from Christian friends of mine that I talk to. Let's not get into each other's minds and try to pretend we know. I can only tell you as someone who was a sincere Christian, what baggage came with the mindset of this one book this New Testament. Oh, and these particular books within our New Testament, which we have established as canon over time, these are telling us the truth and the true story, the historical reliable story about Jesus and his resurrection, his birth, and his divine appearances, if you will, in the world. We have no real serious observations from Christian apologists on looking and recognizing that this is exactly what was going on in the Greek and Roman world. They want to dichotomize and say the New Testament was kind of ultimately free of those myths and pagan ideas. Really, Christianity is something unique and nothing is like it. It never has been and never will be. But little do they really recognize or pay attention to those comparisons and how significant they really are on establishing one's ontology of whether or not Christianity is the true religion. You see, I did not know about those things as a Christian. No one told me that Caesar Augustus had a divine birth and when he died had an apotheosis and people even saw him. Eyewitnesses of him after he was dead, he appeared to them. Of course, he ascends into heaven, becoming a god. But Jesus did all that. Why is it that we only talk about Jesus and not Caesar Augustus? 
well, we're within the baggage and framework of Christianity. We have a long-standing tradition, and that has been kind of rolling downhill onto us, and the weight is overwhelming. You kind of have to go with the flow. And when you have your tradition that you're raised in or taught, this is what you believe. And when you start with your conclusion, you go out of your way to try and prove that conclusion is true. I mean, Paul does say Jesus rose from the dead, but if he didn't, we're still stuck in our sins. Christians are, when they argue, they're arguing within the framework of the Bible. I've even heard Christians argue, well, the Bible says, one of the gospels say that an enemy was convinced that Jesus rose from the dead. For example, look at Paul. I do possibly want to go down the path of examining these kind of ideas, but Paul may have converted as an enemy and then finally taps out. All right, I'm, I'm in. I'm in the game. I'm convinced. Maybe you made some sense because he also lived within a religious bubble. So it's not like this guy was a full on skeptic. This guy was a Jew who really believed in God's word, the whole nine. And he already had a epistemological framework where Christianity could fit right into that. He wasn't a full blown skeptical thinker who didn't have the idea of angels and demons and such in his mind. He already believed in those things. But they'll say stuff like enemies of Jesus ended up realizing he's the son of God. Reading that story and being convinced that the story is telling them a reality about what's really going on. Ladies and gentlemen, we call this really good storytelling, not this is what historically occurred. And these are the problems I run into. It isn't my goal to try and convince the Christian apologists, like I said, and I know that they're probably very confident that their arguments are never going to convince me. My war, my battle is over the winning the minds of the audience out there in the world. Yes, for those who are staunch fundamentalists, I am doing the work of Satan. But to some Christians who are not fundamentalist, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, they say, I'm doing the work of God. I'm not even kidding you. They're so impressed and amazed by the historical research we do at Myth Vision, and they are being educated on a level you aren't finding anywhere else. I'm really impressed with the audience that we have grown here at Myth Vision and the idea that a atheist like myself, or let's just label myself a skeptic for those who want to pigeonhole me in a category that somehow all automatically makes me not worthy of listening to. I'm a skeptic and we're doing research that I've never seen any atheist, any skeptical channel do on this level. I see a lot of Christian apologists, they'll find stuff that Lawrence Krauss might say about Christianity or Michael Shermer might say about Christianity, scientists that their specialty is not within Christianity. They take that stuff and they want to pick it apart. I see some Christian apologists that also want to take some of my works uh, that I do with some academics, whether it be Paula Fredrickson, the list can go on of academics I have, and they want to critique it and they want to bring back a historical reliance and trustworthiness of the New Testament. And this is stuff that they do. But at the end of the day, I know that I'm not going to convince them, and I hope they realize that their words and what they're doing isn't convincing me. It's just driving me deeper, and I'm thankful for the engagements because it's actually helping me grasp more of a conclusion on where I stand on these being man-made religions. All of the religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Abrahamic-wise, and I would even go beyond, are man-made religions. That doesn't mean there isn't some applicable behavioral benefits that come from them. I know a lot of Buddhist friends who say that that worldview extremely helps them and it is something that they apply and it works for them. I know Christians who say that this worldview works for them, but I know for a fact that the ideology I find within the New Testament is kind of a world self-hating kind of ideology. This flesh is bad. This world is corrupt we can't wait for our Lord and Savior to come and fix things, making it all right and better. And that kind of worldview really, I think, is harmful in the long run. So what do I want to do? I'll tell you what I want to do. Yes, I have an ax to grind. Of course I do. I, I came from a radical fundamentalist view, and sure, there are probably some tendencies within me that are in opposition to the worldview I had, which means I still probably have some baggage of fundamentalist tendencies, but in the opposition. Okay, I grant it. Maybe that's the case. I also try to be very polite and, and balanced in my approach of doing these things. But at the end of the day, here's my goal. The historical 
bedrock in which all of this stuff is laid. I want to show you that the God of the Hebrew Bible, the God that the New Testament is ascribing to Jesus, his father, the God that you pray to is an ancient Near Eastern deity that evolves and changes over a long period of time. And if you knew this God's origins as just an ancient Near Eastern deity that had a physical body, had sex, and eventually, of course, stops doing all those things, divorces the wife, Asherah, in particular context, of course, not all Yahweh worshiping had Asherah in it, but the idea in context that it's like the other ancient Near Eastern gods can't be divorced. I want to show you your God was man-made. Not because I can't wait to prove to you because I I just hate God. No, 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 no. If you think that, grow up, little child, grow up. I really want to know the truth. Now, if you aren't interested in truth, then you're watching the wrong video. If you want to know the actual origins of your deity, that's what I'm after. If you want to know what the Israelites actually practiced on a daily or even what the biblical authors taught and say, which was not the popular religion. It was an elitist practice because the common religion was polytheistic within ancient Israel. If you want to know that, you're at the right place. If you want to not be dishonest or unbalanced, or if you're not wanting to be special pleading and pretending that your book is the one and no other books, literature, ancient tablets, etc., are conveying something that is common and similar to what your book is saying, you're at the wrong place if you're that kind of person. That's why I say we're at war. We're at war because we have people who are defending slavery at all costs because their book has their God saying, you can own these people for this long, you can do these things. And of course, it's not their God that's saying it, but that's how they read it. It's really men who wrote this book saying, thus saith the Lord. John J. Collins corrected me on that at one point when I said, well, God says in Hosea, no, God did not say, man said, stop doing that D. And he was right. Man said, this is a man-made religion. Eventually, philosophy comes in. You can thank the Greeks for their philosophical ideas, especially Plato, Socrates, etc. But this Platonic God, this deity above, above all physical material, this God becomes the God that gets equivocated with Yahweh, the father of Jesus. And then, of course, Gnostics wrestle over God being the father of Jesus being all loving. And then, of course, the God of creation being this wicked God. There's certain Gnostic sects that had this particular teaching, it gets really, really confusing. But if you're recognizing within Christianity where it births, where it comes up, what is the historical framework? The same way I'm showing in the ancient Near East that this God is man-made and similar to the other ancient Near Eastern deities, this one just so happened to be successful because its people kept holding on to this deity. And that would be a sign of a miracle to some probably. Well, how come Jews would believe and worship this God lasted so long? I ask you to pay attention to Osiris. You see, a lot of Christians go for 2,000 years, Christian tradition's been around. Well, get this, as long as it's been from now at the start of Christianity using the name Jesus, Osiris was even used longer, well over two millennia BCE. So Osiris's name has been believed far, far longer than Yahweh and Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Another deity has had longer clout, longer testimony, longer history than your deity? Yeah, I know. Tough pill to swallow. If you're interested in knowing that historical framework on the origins of Christianity, and of course, there are various scholars with different ideas, You're at the right place because we're not sitting here trying to shove this is what really happened and is literally true. And by the way, you need to consider joining before you go to hell or annihilated or whatever form, even universalist while they go that path will say, okay, it's going to really suck. God's got to kick your ass first. Then he'll bring you into heaven. If you're not interested in like that kind of stuff uh, and you're interested in actually knowing what people thought, what the history was, you're at the right place. 
Because I'm going to dive into looking at comparative myths, legends, narratives, eyewitness testimony. I mean, look, I've been talking to Dr. Richard C. Miller, and I've got a plan to make a trip and go dive deep with him. In fact, I'm going to be also doing a video talking about Justin Martyr's apology and how they believed in nothing different than those who believed the sons of Jupiter or the stories of the sons of Jupiter. And of course, there were eyewitness testimonies of the Caesars, of course, Romulus. This testimony, this eyewitness testimony tradition finds its way not only in the Romulus story, but throughout the Caesar narratives of their apotheosis. First Corinthians 15 has eyewitness testimony and an apotheosis narrative right there with Jesus being taken up after his burial. He went on high. He ascended into the celestial realm, becoming immortalized. And of course, there's that apocalyptic stuff that goes in with it as well. So at some point, that's supposed to all change. And then everything, everything is going to be a cosmic transformation in his eschatology. When I see eyewitness testimony in legends all around the birth of this thing we call Christianity, why would I go to the Christianity and go, oh, this one's true, but all others are not? We got to take it case by case basis is what they say. Really? Well, I look at it, right? I look at this 1 Corinthians 15. I look at the biblical narrative. I see the legend of the birth narratives and the ascension narratives. I see the legend even in 1 Corinthians 15. But why is it that a Christian sees it there in these other myths like Suetonius, uh, you name it, Plutarch, the list can go on, Cicero, all of the different authors that are around this time. They can see that and go, yeah, 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 yeah. We're with you, man. We hold your hand. And we see that, and that's a problem, right? Those aren't true, but we read the New Testament, and it is. Why are they convinced? Why is it that I was convinced, but I'm not now? And I think that the evidence shows that it all walks like a duck and talks like a duck, and it's a duck. It's man-made, just like everything else is man-made. I'll tell you, I think it's because there is a bit of special pleading, no matter what. There is something psychological that has them pushed over the edge in order to believe that. Yes, I'm going into that area again. I shouldn't go. And that is trying to psychoanalyze why apologists do what they do. But if you said something about my mother or my father offensive, or you are attacking in some way where I felt like I was not comfortable, I will probably naturally defend my mother or my father. Why? I love them. They're my mother and my father. They're family to me. They're very important. Technically, they're sacred to me. And it would be totally normal for you to say, psychologically, there's something there. A defense mechanism comes in because Derek is defending something he believes and he it's instilled in him. I think the same is said about these beliefs for people who actually are believing in them. And they're very touchy subjects, which is why I think they get defensive and they go out of their way to protect them. It gives them meaning and purpose. I mean, if you touch their meaning and purpose for which they live their, their life based off of, if they need this in their mind, there's got to be something going on there. And that's why I mentioned that. So, I use the family analogy because I think that you could equate their beliefs and their trust in Father God the same way Father, mortal earthly father, earthly mother. They kind of put that in that place, if that makes sense. So there's that. I know because that was my experience. Doesn't mean it's yours. Sure, someone can pick this part in the video and find a way to be all critical and show why. Oh, no, no, there's Derek wrong again. I came and I looked at the New Testament because of the historical reliability of it. Historical reliability, just because you find verisimilitude to people, places, and things does not mean the claims within this book are historical. Oh, and by the way, a lot of those claims as well, his people, places, and things aren't necessarily accurate, aren't necessarily historically the case. And we have good reasons to doubt some of these things, even within the Gospels. Many of my academics I bring on show this. Now, of course, apologists will come back with this and they'll have something to say. This is why we see a war going on. So I just speak to you, the audience, whether you're Christian, whether you're not, you don't have to agree with me at the end of the day on my ontology. But I can ask you this. If you watch my videos 
I'm telling you what I'm trying to do. And that is give you the facts on the ground. I've had scholars from Del C. Allison Jr. come on and they play devil's advocate of both sides because they're trying to be in their own mind, like I think all the scholars we know are trying the best they can within their own minds to tell you what they think is true. I just don't want to give you the apologist spiel. And how often do you see a skeptic atheist channel dive this deep into biblical material, this deep, and actually try to unravel the problems that we're seeing in this material and give you the historical context of what is going on. That's why I think we have something unique going on. And that's why I'm glad we're pioneering something that's totally different. So I know if you stay tuned, you're going to learn some more things. I mean, just the other day, I had Jennifer Glancy on talking about slavery and how it is a moral issue for Christians even today. Why? Because Jesus worked within it. The Essenes, we have good evidence that the Essenes, some of them, rejected the notion because they saw it as a crime against humanity to own another human being. The Essenes. And in the Gospels, Jesus is painted as using slavery as a model within his parables and, of course, within his words, according to the Gospels. Whether Jesus said it or not, the author saying Jesus said it, that's bad enough because now how do we know what Jesus himself really said? But he uses slavery as a model. Your Lord and Savior is working with something that I would say no matter what today we're aware of, is a horrible moral problem. Now, what happens? Well, slavery wasn't what you think. Jennifer Glancy, expert on first century slavery, just to use one scholar in one example, she rips that to shreds and explains how bad it was. Sexual violence was done to them and how they had no human autonomy. They, no, they had no free will technically. They were, they were the owned of the slave owner. They, they were the property of these people. And it was horrific. So what do we do? We get Christian apologists. Rather than saying, yeah, that's bad. And this is a really, really, really rough issue. Well, it well, wasn't as bad as you think it is. You just want to compare it to the South, the slavery in antebellum South uh, with African Americans uh, and the white men. Nah, there's differences between that and the biblical stuff too. My point in all of this is this war that we're in right now, you, the viewer, can play a significant role. Number one, if you like what we're doing, support the channels that are doing this kind of work to help grow what we're doing so that we can keep bringing on academics to educate the world and help you get the real context, not just the, the agenda-driven apologetical angle. I want the historical methodology being used. I don't care what their ontology is at the end of the day. I interview Christians, not apologists. I interview Buddhists or atheists or agnostics or whoever, wherever, whatever, I'm not interested in ax grinding apologetics. I'm interested in historical methodology that isn't bringing that baggage with it, which means there's a naturalistic framework in which we can determine what we're looking at and what we see. You get to the miraculous, you might say it's a genre. You might say as a rationalist might, okay, they're like kind of like these people in the third world country who are doing sleight of hand or something and they're convincing people. Sure. The last thing we're thinking is literal, actual, miraculous claims are the case. That's something you decide on your own, but that is not what we're going to push on this channel because Christians don't do that when they're doing the claims for other deities. They don't believe those things are all true, but theirs they do. Muslims are doing the same thing with their particular worldview. They have their own spin not interested. So help us with this battle, this war, by liking the videos of the content creators you like, by sharing the content out there as far and as wide as you can. Leaving a comment goes a very far distance in helping the algorithm pay attention. Even if it is just a comment, here's one for the algorithm. 
because we have such large Christian apologetic channels that get all this attention and there's there's really an ideological war going on to speed up the process and make this material more broad and more public that's how you can help you can help in several ways in fact just in case you missed it i don't know why sometimes my best videos i do when i record them don't go viral but then some of my videos i don't have to put a lot of thought into literally go viral and it's like, what the heck is going on with the algorithm? The last video that I just did, I have a four-part scripted series with Dr. Joshua Bowen on Genesis, borrowing, using the ancient Mesopotamian literature, like the Enuma Elish and how you got the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Enuma Elish, and then the ancient Anzu myth. And I show in the first video, really Dr. Joshua Bowen shows, but I am the spokesperson. I'm the face of it how the Anzu bird myth literally was reused in later Mesopotamian, the same kind of civilization, right? If we wanted a genealogical timeline, they used the older Anzu myth where, um, Nur uh, what's the name of the deity? I can't remember the name of the deity with the N, but that God could barely defeat Anzu, actually couldn't without Ea giving the insight to shoot the arrow. And then when it calls back the arrow and the feather and whatnot, it kills the bird. That later idea gets picked up and reused within Marduk Smith in the Enuma Elish. So I'm like, okay, we, we're, we're right there in the first video. How come that video is not like flying off the shelves right now? You can help. Please help us out in this battle. Of course, I don't want anyone going out and being rude or derogatory to those who are in the faith. I have gone on record of saying, and I use this analogy because I was an addict. So please do not dehumanize people by taking this as a derogatory thing. But a drug addict is someone who is trapped in a vicious cycle of addiction, of a habit that is formed, oftentimes there's psychological, environmental reasons that drive person like myself to want to escape reality. And the drugs help you to do that. It's a coping mechanism. I think that religion is often a coping mechanism, giving meaning and purpose to people, but also the fear of death can be overcome in this as well. And there are various other things. It's not one size fits all. But I do think that the apologists that are driven and really, really go out of their way to die on the hill of protecting and defending their faith, that's because I'm touching something sacred here. And rather than being rude or thinking they're stupid, they're not. They're very, very smart people. I want to leave this impression on you. They're very, very smart people. But what's happening isn't that they're not smart. It's that there, there's a psychological thing I really think going on, and the defending of this worldview is what is driving them to make claims and do the things that they're doing for their worldview. So they might say the same reversal claim to me, but if I equated a drug addict who's suffering with addiction and how we should be tender and loving and encouraging and trying to be polite and help them because they're in a bad spot, I, I want to use that analogy to say we should do the same for the apologist rather than the war the atheists that are down there in the in the chat of the apologist youtube channels that are being overly derogatory rude they don't represent me and i hope that the apologists watching this know that i do not want a war that is causing harm i'm saying there's a battle of minds going on and i really do think that that psychological battle is there so please, I don't hate drug addicts, and I hope you don't either, because I was one. I love them, and I want to see them do well, but I also wonder if they're stuck, because I remember being trapped in this worldview myself, thinking, I, I got to make sense of it, and I got to make it make true, I got to make the most sense of it that it's true, what is the, the evidence that supports that it isn't wrong, and it was like protecting my mom or my dad. If my dad really did something wrong and someone tried to call me out, I would I would defend him. I would protect him. My brother, my brother's done several things wrong. And he's gotten in fights in high school where he was kind of part of the instigating. I still went in and fought for him and defended him. That's my point. So we have to rise above in some way and be 
the bigger person and be respectful if you think that you're correct on this, which I do think that this is what's going on. And I don't do it for no reason. I do it with with evidence backing myself up on this. But we do need to create that communication better. With that communication not being good, I cannot see how apologists will come over and ever be convinced of their worldview being wrong because they're always up in arms and defensive. And I think the same could be said if they were trying to convince us. Just saying. So let's create a better conversation. Here's the long vented version of me just saying, we're at a battle here in terms of ideologies, which affect all sorts of other things from politics, ethics, you name it. Do you want to see the world become a better place? I do. And I am in no way saying we need to shut down all religion or people should not be allowed to practice them. Fundamentalism is an absolute opposition, in my opinion, to being able to freely think. This is Derek Lambert, and we are Myth Vision.